Thank you for joining the second day of Encompass. Um, yesterday we had excellent panel discussions and then today we're going to continue the, the momentum with conversations uh, with panel two, I mean panel three and panel number four. But uh, before we get started, I wanted to just, um, you know, give everyone a warm welcome, let you sort of get acquainted to the room. Uh, please mute yourself if you're not speaking, that way uh, the, there won't be uh, a bunch of noise. And one of the things that is a privilege uh, working for the American Institute of Architects is to have the support of companies and you know, architecture firms that allow us to do programs like this. So I want to, um, you know, first of all, thank our annual sponsors. They're on the screen here. Uh, our annual sponsors sort of carry the, uh, you know, the entire burden of our, our of our yearly operations, and we re really appreciate their support. Uh, for this program, Encompass, we have some very distinguished sponsors. Uh, I'd like to thank Unibel Rodamco Westfield as the presenting sponsor. Uh, I'd also like to thank Steinberg Hart, uh, Penta Building Group, and ZGF for their support. And then our participating sponsors include HKS, KFA, NAC Architecture, PCL, PCL Construction Services, Hanson LA, Bernard's, and Co-Architects. And so with that, we're going to get our program started. I'm going to, um, you know, we're going to bring to the screen um, both Joshua and Matthew, who are the co-moderators. Uh, this is something that I'm really excited to bring them in and get them involved with Encompass this year. Uh, and with that, we're going to turn it over to Matthew and Joshua, and they're going to uh, help us uh, welcome the panel. Thank you, Will. Good morning, everyone. We're really excited to have all of you here. Um, we have a really, really great panel set up for you this morning. Um, so the panel is entitled Student Driven Discussions on the Impact of Coronavirus and Pre-Existing Inequalities. Basically, that means that we're going to talk to students. We're going to hear how they're feeling, how, how, how they felt entering architecture school, the transition into everything that's happening right now, um, and just learning a little bit more about, uh, about their thoughts around all these different things that are happening. Um, and then we're fortunate enough to, after that, have a, another follow-up discussion with faculty um, to be able to get some feedback from them based on what the students are saying and based on their, their thoughts around these topics as well. Um, as Will said, my name is Joshua Foster. Um, I'm a designer at KFA Architecture on the board of SoCal NOMA and the co-chair of the new joint AIA and NOMA Equity Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee, the JEDI Committee. So we're really happy to have you here. And here's Matthew. Hi, good morning, everyone. This is Matthew Trotter, a designer at Cunningham Group. I sit on the board of SoCal NOMA. I'm also the director of the developing uh, professionals there, and uh, I'm excited for the panel discussion today. Thank you. So yeah, so we're, we're going to dive right in, but before we do, we want our student panelists to be able to have a second to introduce themselves. Um, so we can start off with Deja, and then the rest of you can follow before we get started. Good morning, everyone. My name is Deja Slack. I'm from Moreno Valley, California, by way of Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm pursuing a Master's of Architecture at Howard University. Greetings, everybody. My name is Jessica Florence. I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. I'm a fourth year student at Florida A&M University. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kate Bogdanov. I'm from Moscow, Russia, and I'm pursuing my graduate degree at USC, and I'm also graduate director of NOMAS at USC. My name is Khan Mohammed. I'm a student at Woodbury University, fourth year undergrad for architecture. I'm the chapter president of our NOMAS chapter here, as well as the student board member uh, for SoCal NOMA. Good morning, my name is Stephen Curtis. I'm a second year uh, student at East La Architecture Student at, at uh, East Los Angeles College. Um, I am current vice president of our NOMAS chapter. Good morning, everyone. I'm Stephanie Green. I'm a fifth year student at Woodbury University and I'm the vice president of our NOMAS chapter. 
Thank you all very much. Um, so, so we're going to get started right away. And to make this fun, um, we actually decided to change up the way this panel looks and make it a Jeopardy style panel. Um, so the students will have the chance to answer questions. Um, and once the time runs out for their portion of the panel, we are going to pass it over to the faculty. Um, so without further ado, we'll get started with Deja for 100. So Deja, when you entered architecture school, what were your initial expectations? Um, so when I entered architecture school, my initial expectations were to have classes that taught me design fundamentals um, for as far as drafting and drawing before translating that into BIM software. Um, and that's essentially what happened. And a lot of that also ended up being self-taught and from like peer to peer help as well um, to just elaborate just more on the technical standpoint from what we would learn in studio as a first year. That's good. Thank you. So up next, we have Khan for 300. Khan, when you, oh, where, <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, Khan, if you could create one class to be added to the architecture curriculum, what would it be? I'd make a class, um, I'd craft a class that's on the intersections of politics, policy making, and public administration. Through my academic career, there's been a lot of focus on solving uh, housing deficits, uh, systemic racism, and climate change. I feel like moving on into the field, architects would need to learn topics or, or how, to, uh, how to move in politics, policymaking, and public administration so that we could start to understand how architects could then affect the built environment at a larger scale. Very good answer. Thank you. Up next, we have Steven for 400. Steven, in architecture school, do you feel as though there is enough representation of people that look like you? If not, where have you looked for this representation? So currently, uh, I am, I wanna say, one of four African-American students within our architecture department. Um, so I definitely feel like there, there's not enough representation um, but I feel like that kind of stems from there being a, a really kind of a lack of um, representation and support of, uh, of this field within uh, minority communities. Um, but for me, I was fortunate enough to kind of um, be introduced to NOMA at a very young, uh, very early age. Um, and that's kind of been my, my core uh, inspiration for, for looking for uh, architects that uh, kind of look like me. Very good answer, thank you. So next we have Kate for 100. Kate, at this point in your architectural journey, how do you feel that your education has prepared you to enter the profession? Um, I, fairly, I think that our education prepares us uh, fairly bad for the profession, so there is a lot of design exercises, but there is a lack of a professional practice classes that explain how building the building from A to Z basically works. And uh, I think I learned a lot through my internships and learned actually more what, from what I can implement right away after school than I learned at school. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Up next, we have Stephanie for 400. Stephanie, when you entered architecture school, what were your initial expectations? I thought I would be learning about uh, famous buildings such as the Walt Disney Concert Hall and how to incorporate those drastic moves into my architecture. But when I started at Woodbury, it was more of a gradual increase of complexity. So it wasn't a, a jump right in all the way kind of thing. Quick follow-up question on that. Do you, do you feel like that was a, a helpful thing to be able to have it gradually go in? 
I think it was helpful because it, it helps later on, uh, you know, develop a process, but at the same time, it, it also loses some excitement. So there, I think there needs to be a better balance in that area. Thank you, that's a very good point. Up next, we have Jessica for 500. Jessica, how has COVID-19 and the transition to an online heavy daily life impacted your situation in the architectural field? You're on mute. <laughs> no problem. COVID has affected me um, in more than one way. The pandemic hit about mid spring semester. Um, physical, Physical space is essential for me um, to get uh, a better experience in teaching and learning. Uh, COVID kind of created this disconnect for me uh, with architecture since I'm so used to being in the studio. Uh, but it kind of forces you to recognize that there is like a segregation of knowledges, but it's not all bad because COVID, like with the situation, it provides like great opportunities for new ideas and innovations for future designs. Uh, I was also diagnosed after the pandemic uh, with breast cancer, uh, stage four. So um, it had a clinic, another clinical impact on me. Um, but um, yeah. That, that, Thank you. That's understandable. And, and a follow up, Jessica, um, with all of the, the difficulties that has come with COVID-19, do you feel that you've been supported by your, uh, uh, by the higher education, by your, by your college? Have you received the, 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 the level of support that you kind of expected, uh, whether it be internet connection or, or, or hardware? I would say uh, my institution has been very supportive um, of my situation. And they've also um, extended a helping hand with resources, funding. So it's been a good and bad experience, I would say. That's good, thank you for sharing that. Next we have Kate for 500. Kate, if you could create one class to be added to the architecture curriculum, what would that be? Um, I think I would uh, add something about uh, the economy of, of building buildings, just um, everything that's involved in that, uh, the real estate uh, situation here in the US and how it affects also the underprivileged communities here. So I think that architects really do not understand the economics and how they change and the, what they change with their buildings, also in terms of gentrification, for example. That's good, yeah, understanding the finances and the economy is really important. Up next, we have Khan for 200. Khan, so for you, how has COVID-19 and the transition to an online heavy daily life impacted your situation in the architectural field? So it basically put studio culture on pause, um, right as we were starting to get into our final final models. Um, for working, it completely threw that out the window. Um, I secured an internship like in January, but they had to cancel because of COVID. Um, and then studying, oddly enough, helped, um, or COVID-19 increased my uh, increase my ability to study just because we were um, just because we were at home and we had ability to you know stay focused I guess um, but it comes to like with pros and cons of course there's an internet disparity so I oftentimes had issues with like listening to the lectures because they'd cut in and out um, or at least just communicating having that studio environment where you could just pop ideas off one another um, instantaneously. Now you have to like, it's, it takes more time, but then again, we have the platform to be more connected to. So it's kind of, eh. <laughs> I think eh sums up how a lot of people are feeling right now without our, the way we've had to transition um, even in, in the work world. I'd, I'd like to follow up on that con. Um, 
do you have any um, uh, ways in which you would you would like uh, your uh, the studio to be treated or the you know difficulties with dealing with your professor's work is there is it a matter of um, is there any solutions that you could provide maybe there's well, there's documents that supplement this or, or different times of the day that that you would like to be taught like well, do you have any suggestions I, I was homeschooled for high school so I do have a bit of background in like online learning and I've learned that there's like asynchronous and synchronous type of, or, or methodologies of online teaching and learning. Um, synchronous would be when everybody is on the same uh, call doing the work at the same time. This works at more of a local level and that increases studio culture because everybody's on the call working at the same time. But that provides an issue when you have students out of state in a different time zone where you have a call at 8 a.m. on the East Coast and then people in, on the West Coast have to get up at five, right? And so in that situation, asynchronous teaching methodologies would step in where you set something out, you have a deadline for it like at the end of the week and then each student has the capacity to go at their own pace and make that deadline. Um, so you take away, or you make it more flexible for them to go over that time difference hump. Um, so both methods could be played around with and toyed with um, in order to create the best balanced. Um, and, for, and for the most part, you have been experiencing synchronous. Yes. Okay. Right. Thanks for sharing. Up next, we have Jessica for 400. So Jessica, if you could create one class to be added to the architecture curriculum, what would it be for you? Um, I would love to see more demo classes, um, maybe designing, um, taking the time to design like container homes or tiny houses. We're moving more towards uh, green building, sustainability. And I think that those hands-on projects uh, and having demo classes would be definitely effective for future um, classes. So you're talking about so maybe more of like a design build type studio environment? For design build. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. Up next we have Stephanie for 200. In architecture school, do you feel as though there is enough representation of people that look like you? If not, where have you looked for this representation? I feel that there's uh, people that look like me. Um, we have uh, a fair uh, distribution between women in architecture and males in architecture at Woodbury University. However, in the age group and in the experience, I look more towards my professors as my colleagues. Um, and so it's that experience age gap is a, is a little awkward when going back to school, but um, I'm fortunate to have the professors that I have. That's good, that's good. Yeah, having a good relationship with your professors definitely helps, helps a lot. Up next, we have Deja for 500. So Deja, for you, if you could create one class to be added to the architecture curriculum, what would it be? Okay. <clears throat> um, if I could create one class, it would be mental health and architecture. Um, one thing about architecture students is that we tend to never sleep. Um, and besides the sleep aspect, there's also life challenges and some students um, express that to their professors or they choose to keep it private. And so speaking from personal experience, it's been times where I've worked myself so much that I've had anxiety attacks that have put me in the hospital throughout my matriculation of undergraduate school. So this class would be like a weekly check-in of workload, study hall, counseling sessions, and meditation where the professors could kind of see 
how they could be assistants to maybe other students in a certain years and share this at faculty meetings to see really mentally what's kind of going on with the students in their courses for design. I think that's that's really important. It, it's definitely definitely want to be able to prevent burnout when you're an architecture student because it's very easy to to get burnt out and jaded before you even get into the profession and that's that's not really good for us as, as we get into it i mean being able to have that support group personally for me my my mental health class was going to every single usc football game while i was in grad school but that doesn't work <laughs> out for everyone so yeah having a class for that would, would be really good deja follow up um that's a very interesting suggestion. I think it's a really cool idea for a, an elective. But do you also believe that um, there's an issue with just how uh, architecture schools typically uh, pursue their curriculums? Is, you know, is there an inherent issue with how we're being taught? I don't think there's an issue with how we're being taught. And that's just speaking from like, Howard's perspective. Um, what I think is that there's a disconnect maybe with professors over certain years. Um, while they may be communicating what type of courses or um, assignments that they're going to give, they don't necessarily think about the workload for maybe a structures class and a studio project that's due that has a crit in two weeks, like two weeks later. So it's like, the amount of work I'm putting into one class and another, it just becomes a super, just really stressful. And so instead of speaking up about it, which is seen as an excuse, we choose to keep that bottled inside and just figure it out and push it to the end. So I think it just needs to be more of a connect with communicating, the communication aspect is a little broken on the um, faculty side. Yeah, architecture uh, curriculum, you know, for a long time has been a little bit of the feed them to the wolves and if they survive, the best will, will, <laughs> will come out. And, uh, and though I do believe the goal is to create really strong, powerful uh, uh, designers with a, a great skill set, it can come with the detriment of of putting incredible amounts of pressure as we all know because we all went to school that uh some of it is unneeded so thank you for for that suggestion yeah thank you You're up next we have jessica for 300 jessica for you when you entered architecture school what were your initial expectations so my expectations, uh, I was thinking I was going to be this great architect, um, designing on the softwares. I, I wasn't introduced um, early to the softwares. Um, sorry, let me take a moment. Um, it's okay. <laughs> so expectations. I came in with the expectations of learning to draw because I didn't know how to draw, learning the software because I was not familiar with the software. This was something new to me. I didn't initially come in wanting to do architecture. So um, expectations was to learn all the fundamentals, to learn how to draw, sketch, design on the computers. But reality was there was a lack of resources for my school. There was a lack of funding and um, I was unable to, I was unable to, I'm so sorry. No, it's okay. Yes. I experienced the same, <laughs> I experienced the same thing at USC. I mean, I, you know, I, I came in there, one of the very, like, three three or four black people and I just had never used AutoCAD. I had never used any of these programs and I felt like I had started well behind the pack and yeah. everyone else that, that didn't look like me, it seemed like they had already, they knew who Le Corbusier was. They knew about the architects that they were teaching and they knew the programs. And I looked, I felt that I was stupid. I felt right. dumb. And so, um, you know, 
I, I, I feel you and I understand. So, you know, yeah, right. Yeah. Reality is, um, reality was I didn't know anything and it was harder for me. And I struggled my first two years of college because I didn't have that technical background. A lot of students come in with that technical background. And when you're coming in, not knowing that you want to do architecture, it's a little bit harder. So the expectation is to come in learning new things, the fundamentals and reality is that you're not going to know everything. You're not going to be able to get it on the spot. It's a learning process. It's a growing process. And so did you hear about architecture late, later in I, your life? I initially went to, was in school for um, industrial design um, and engineering. And I'm more of a hands-on type of person. I love to design. I'm not really a technical person. I wanted to be more creative. And so I went into architecture instead. And um, it was definitely very difficult um, in the beginning. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I, I know a lot of us have similar experiences, mine similar to Matthew, and it's it's not an easy thing to do. So definitely kudos for you for sticking it out. I mean, you're you're still in it, and it sounds like you're doing a great job. So we, we definitely are excited for you. Thank you. So up next we have Stephen for two hundred. Stephen, for you at this point in your architectural journey, how do you feel that your education has prepared you to enter the profession? <clears throat> so for me, the, my, the education aspect um, has taught me a lot, you know, between um, the design and the, the more technical aspects. Um, but I feel like one thing that I've heard and, and learned over the past year is that obviously, no student goes into the design field um, as a designer. Um, so it's, it's really been about what can I, um, what can I bring in, or what can I take into um, the, the profession when I enter um, based off of, you know, these early years of my education um, within architecture. And fo so for me, one thing that has um, definitely stood out, and I think uh, Professor Hamner can also um, agree with this, is um, the importance of understanding context. Context guides uh, the full project. Um, and so that's something I've taken from design. Um, so not necessarily the designing aspect, um, but the understanding of how context drives uh, the project itself. Um, another thing I think uh, that has helped, that's helped me tremendously um, is kind of just the te my teachings on uh, the multiple softwares. Um, that's something that ELAC has provided and um, I'm forever grateful for, you know, starting out uh, in the architecture in, in, in this, um, in this major, um, mm -hmm. is understanding softwares like AutoCAD, Revit, uh, SketchUp, Rhino, um, within uh, a year and a half. Um, so uh, I think that has greatly helped me uh, into the, into the profession. That's good. That's, that's very good. Yeah. Understanding context is, is huge. I mean, a lot of the issues we face in our communities right now, um, unfortunately, I feel is because a lot of designers don't take into mind the context of the community. So being able to understand that even before you get into the profession is a good sign for the next generation of designers. Up next, we have Khan for 400. Khan, at this point in your architecture journey, how do you feel that your education has prepared you to enter the profession? I've seen like ProPrac courses um, and similar to what Steven's trying to, uh, or was saying was like, they do prepare you for like some nuances in the profession, but I feel like those courses fail to like reach students because at this point in their career like all all students are focused on all their classes the majority of their classes are focused on is design 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 and so we have this one-off class that's about profession i mean about practice and so that's kind of looking the other way while everybody's still focused here and so the retention rate of the things that students are learning in that class might not be as uh, not, might not be as successful as it can be. And so that results in having this 
transition period from graduation to practice because you're so design oriented and then you realize wait there's like 99 percent like other things that i have to do when it comes to architecture like all this other stuff that i was didn't that i kind of brushed over and so i feel like those types of skills aren't really taught um to the best ability at universities um oftentimes students have to find and mine those those uh practice those experiences and skills through internships which aren't equally accessible so that's a very very good point um so basically you're kind of looking for more of a balance or seeming of emphasis from the curriculum to put more of an emphasis on professional practice so that the, the weight of it is a bit more heavy as you feel that it is in the professional world. Yes. That's good. So next we have Kate for 400. Kate. Kate. Oh, oh you got it. <laughs> <laughs> How is COVID, uh, has COVID-19 and the transition to an online heavy daily life impacted your situation in the architectural field? So I think the biggest impact was of course the community as someone else already mentioned. It's uh, really hard to connect with people out that usually were right in your studio and you can just go, go and talk to them. Um, it's, I feel especially bad for people who just joined the architecture school this fall because they have no connections in, the, in their class. It's very hard, hard to build friendships and build relations. UC does their best and we as student organizations try to help them, but it's uh, pretty tough. And obviously online environment can't replicate the in-person communication. Also as, like it, as an international student, I feel there was quite a lot of tribulations during this period. There was a period when we were, uh, the administration tried to throw us out of the country. And now there are a lot of students who are stuck abroad and can't return. And again, I think USC does their best to support all the students who are in different time zones, uh, but it's obviously an issue for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, I can, can't, can't even imagine the extra stress having to not be sure if you're even going to be allowed to be in the country while you're in school. And as Khan alluded to with the different types of, of learning when everyone's on the call at the same time and you're a, a lot of hours away, it, I'm, I'm sure that it definitely changes up your whole entire internal schedule, which is tough. Yeah. We definitely have some students in China who just, sleep uh, during the day, I guess, and study at night. Yeah. Wow. So next we have Jessica for 100. Jessica, for you in architecture school, do you feel as though there's been enough representation of people that look like you? And if not, where have you been able to find this representation? Well, I go to an HBCU, so there are a lot of people who look like me. Um, but as far as representation um, um, from a gender standpoint in architecture, there's not a lot of females that, um, that are in the architecture field. And I think we should definitely see more of that. But when you're not recruiting for it and you're not, um, you're not seeing many African-American female faces, um, then that's when you see a lack of that representation. That's good, that's a very good point. Did um, a, a quick follow-up question on that. Um, and Deja, you can actually jump in on this as well. Since both of you are at HBCUs, did you make, uh, was, was your choice to go to an HBCU for that reason of looking for representation or was it something that drew you in in, in another way? I want to say um, going to an HBCU is generational. Um, based off when you go to an HBCU, it's typically based off of struggle. And so you want when you we wanted to go to a school, I wanted to go to a school where I could connect with people who struggled like me. 
um, and who looked like me and that I could connect with. That's good. And quick pause real quick. Um, unfortunately, not everybody knows what HBCU is and hopefully that, that, that changes HB. No, it's my fault for bringing it up without saying HBCU is a historically black college or university. So for those that, that don't know that, all right, Deja. Oh, yes. And from my perspective, um, my parents went to an HBCU and finishing high school in California, I did a whole college world trip and looked at different architecture schools. But my cousin actually graduated from Howard University architecture program in 1997. And so that just encouraged me more to kind of be in a space where I had professors that looked like me, students that looked like me, and people I felt like would support me throughout my journey. And so that's what ultimately led my decision to choosing an HBCU over another institution. That's good. Yeah, it's it's interesting that both of you have had a le legacy of generations before you at HBCUs, because I think a lot of people definitely out here on the West Coast, I'm from the East Coast, so I, I knew a lot about it, but on the West Coast, you may not even know that these exist um, and hopefully that this is something that starts to starts to change because there are, as we can see here, very great architecture programs and students that come out of these these universities. Um, oh, perfect. Look at that. Deja, you're, you're up again. <laughs> Deja for 400. <laughs> Deja, at this point in your architectural journey, how do you feel that your education has prepared you to enter the profession? Um, I feel as though the courses that we have at Howard um, take a huge focus on like professionalism in architecture. And from when I first entered the program into now, um, over the years, we've just always gained extra resources such as laser cutters, 3D printers, wood shop things to make us more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh gosh, I just had to blank. Um, essentially, just making sure that we're competing at the same level with other schools around us. And so while that was important to the educational um, side, I know when I started my first internship, um, I felt very prepared. Um, a lot of my cohort would kind of come to me all the time and ask me questions about Revit and other BIM resources. And so I put a lot of self-doubt on myself original, uh, initially because I was like, oh, okay, maybe they won't look at HBCU education being the same um, as another school, but I was actually more prepared than I thought I was. And so I feel like my architectural journey this, this far has been great in that aspect. Uh, can I, uh, uh, similar to what uh, Deja said, um, Jessica, have you had any internships or had any experiences where you felt like uh, uh, your colleagues um, um, at possibly a seminar or a conference heard that you went to an HBCU and, and you felt there was kind of a misunderstanding of, of, of your level of education. Have you ever felt that? Um, when I did my internship at Jacobs, um, they never gave me the notion that I was there's like a horizontal organization. So nobody's above you, nobody's under you. And it's, mm -hmm. it's crazy because they ask you, um, they have no issues with asking you for help. Um, but for me, um, it was very, very um, strange that when I introduced my school, um, nobody knew what it was and they didn't know what an HBCU was. And I thought that was a problem because um, I thought it was a problem because why can't I get it together? <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> it's okay. No just, just, just imagine that, that, that screen where it only shows about <laughs> four people. There's, there's no one else on the call. <laughs> so thinking think thinking too way. much. I'm thinking too much. <laughs> um, but no, it kind of alarms me because I feel like you might alter your decisions on um, how, what work I, sh I can do and what I can't do based off mm. of my school mm. and your knowledge about my school. That's a very good point. It's a very good point. That's a good follow-up question. Thank you, Matt. 
Um, up next, we have Stephanie for 100. I'm going to be able to knock out a few more of these questions before we pass it over to the faculty. Um, Stephanie, for you, how has COVID and the transition to online heavy daily life impacted, impacted your situation in the architectural field? Uh, well, as Khan said earlier, studio was just taken from us and that's where I spent <laughs> all of my time, most of my time being around people to see inspiration, to just piggyback off of ideas, that collaboration is not there anymore, even in an online environment. Um, and then just the, you know, going to class and having that structure and having everything in front of you, all the materials you need in front of you, being a physical learner and, an, and an, a visual learner the physical aspect is gone and the visual is now uh kind of um you know i guess exaggerated in an anxiety way where we're trying to coordinate different links and different um softwares and new websites and how professors want to teach that in the online environment. There's Zoom, there's Ring Central, there's Google Meet, there's, um, and that's just meetings. There's, there's websites, there's blogs, there's, you know, all of these things. And it's like, I don't have the normal textbook in front of me anymore. I just have a computer with a bunch of tabs open at once. And so, uh, just the coordination of that. I wish more professors would understand that from our side. That's a good point. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go Steven for 300. Then I believe this, this should be our last one that we're going to do before we pass it over to faculty. So it's good. We got everyone to at least do three questions here. Oh, that is very small, but that says, Stephen, if you could create one class to be added to the architecture curriculum, what would it be? Um, so if I could create one class that could be art, uh, added to the curriculum, I think um, what would be interesting is kind of um, bouncing off of, of what was stated earlier about this kind of gap between the profession and um, and current uh, school curriculum. Um, I think it'd be interesting to kind of find a way to kind of link those two um, and, you know, kind of create this um, kind of intro class to um, kind of getting yourself uh, a little head, a little head um, in, within the profession um, so that you can be a little, you know, better prepared uh, once you leave the, once you leave uh, the, the academic world. That's good. Thank you. I think that was a, a really good way to close out this section. Um, so we thank you all, all, all the students very much. You had very good answers, very inspiring answers, and hopefully not too tough of answers for our faculty up next to hopefully be able to tackle. Um, so thank you all. Um, and let's move on to this next portion here. So this next portion, uh, before we get started, um, we'd like the faculty members that are part of this discussion um, to introduce themselves. Um, first one I see on my screen up, um, we can start with Alvin and then we can move on from there for introductions. Uh, thanks Josh um, and thanks for having me here. It's really exciting to be here and uh, to see all these beautiful faces. Um, my name is Alvin Huang. I'm the Director of Graduate Architecture at USC School of Architecture and I also am the Principal of Synthesis Design and Architecture here in Los Angeles. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Erin Gensler. I am the Assistant Chair at Woodbury. Um, and I'm also very proudly the NOMAS uh, chapter's uh, faculty advisor. Um, I also have a small firm and I'm a registered architect and occasionally I teach at San Juan College as well. I don't know if there's an order, Josh, so I'll go. Uh, hello, everybody. Michael Hamner, uh, practicing architect, chair of the architecture program at East Los Angeles College. 
happy to say, as Josh brought up earlier, you know, we are also a, a NOMA site um, and growing and expanding. We host the uh, NOMA summer camp and uh, it's part of our uh, mission and goal to increase our success in, and uh, representation of uh, underrepresented populations and expanding our success and experience into greater into uh, larger communities and sharing East Los Angeles's um, uh, success in this. Glad to be here. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dahlia Endum. I'm a registered architect and assistant professor at Howard University. Um, just very encouraged by the student responses um, just now, a lot of um, great responses. I'm looking forward to the discussion of faculty. Awesome, thank you all very much. We are excited and honored to have you here. So um, we'll get started right away. I think to knock out uh, the first the first topic of, of discussion and anyone who has uh, thought on this can can start in on it um, because of where we are right now which is in front of our computer screens in each of our whether it's rooms our offices kitchens or wherever we're working um, and we've heard about the differences that the students have been able to overcome uh, because of covid so what's the, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly of COVID-19 for you all as faculty um, and online learning? Any, any lessons learned, any best practices, or even any things that you're still trying to figure out? I guess I, I can jump in then. Um, I think, um, you know, coming into our, starting this semester, being online again, you know, we had more time to, to basically try to implement and recreate um, a studio culture as best we can. I know that was one of the things that a lot of the students brought up was the lack of studio culture now that we're in an online environment. So we've been trying our best to use the technologies available to us to recreate that. Um, and so I think that is a good opportunity because we've, you know, we've tried to test out new technologies, basically rethink the way we teach architecture. So I think there are opportunities in there for how we teach architecture as a whole moving into the future. So for example, using collaborative kind of whiteboard tools like Mural, um, we started using this semester, which has proved successful so far. We're only about a week and a half in, but allowing the students to have um, a kind of desk space that, um, they, that we can view and their peers can view. So their peers um, can view it um, synchronously during our studio sessions, but also asynchronously. Um, so in the intent is that um, they can then begin to have these offline exchanges as they would um, in the evenings in studio. So, you know, trying to um, use technologies um, like that to help to improve the studio culture as best we can in an online environment. Um, other opportunities so far have been, you know, being able to tap into people in different locations um, that we would not have been able to regularly invite to the studio, or invite to lecture. That's been really useful um, and, and we hope to kind of continue doing that in the future. Um, otherwise, you know, from the, the kind of the bad side, you know, just constantly managing, um, as Deja was saying, mental health, like we, we do at least in our studio, do like a mental health check-in, like how is everyone doing? Um, because we know architecture um, education can be stressful and then kind of layering COVID, layering resource issues, layering other issues that students may be dealing with on top of that. Um, we are, you know, we recognize that and we try to, to, you know, constantly be aware of that and make sure the students are okay and seeking help if they need to. So. I would say on the bad side, it's just kind of managing all of the resource technology and mental health issues. So, um, so far we're still figuring it out, but I think we've found some good strategies to, to begin with. Thank you. Yeah, I think if you were to have asked me, um, let's say six months ago, whether or not it was possible to teach architecture online, I would have firmly resoundingly said no. Um, and uh, after having done it for one semester, I actually feel like not only is it possible in some ways, it can potentially be better. Um, you know, like the, the outcome and the, the product of the work, uh, let's say in a kind of screen-based format, there's a, a certain, dis okay, there are technological issues with equity, but there are 
other issues of equity that actually come to the forefront that are positives in terms of when you're on the screen, there is no front of the room, there's no back of the room, there is no uh, kind of distribution of, of, let's say, cost when it comes to modeling, right? Like the, the, the issues of modeling are actually just about effort and skill. There are issues about proficiency. Um, but I would say one of the things that I've consistently been talking to about students and the way we've tried to reformat uh, the work at the School of Architecture in the graduate program is actually to, uh, you know, one of the directives I've given my uh, studio coordinators this year is not at all to try to do a diluted version of what we've done before in terms of trying to think about physical models or trying to think about things that are, uh, let's say, on screen versions of something we used to do physically. Um, and just telling people to buy in and go hard on the digital. And so if we're going to be fully digital, let's be the best we can be at being digital. Um, and the goal I've given every student at the School of Architecture is to graduate in this moment, knowing that they are masters of remote collaboration, that they can enter the workforce and be able to tell people that they know how to work remotely and collaboratively in ways that other people have not even thought about. And so I think one of the things that has been a strength for me in terms of thinking about this is the fact that architecture as a profession has been doing this for a very, very long time. Um, you know, I've been involved in many, 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 many projects in my lifetime. I've probably been in the same city as one of the projects I've been working on like 10% of the times. You know, so whether it's clients, uh, consultants, whatever, I'm very, very used to, let's say, remote collaboration. Um, now it's taking it to another level. And I think that's something where students at this point, I'm saying, have the ability to, um, let's say, leverage their innate abilities as social media savants and digital natives uh, to take advantage of this moment and do things that actually I feel like the faculty are the ones at the disadvantage. Where before the, the faculty, like now we're seeing other equity issues, which are actually, let's say, the students know how to use Zoom much better than many of the faculty do. And so like, we have this issue of trying to like say, okay, okay, how do we get the right faculty or support to certain faculty so that they can do their job and where the younger faculty are able to take advantage of the medium. And I think right now, you know, like Marshall McLuhan often says, uh, you know, the medium, the, the medium is the message. And in this case, the medium now is a screen-based format. So how do we take advantage of that? But I think as Dahlia mentioned, the bigger issue is not the output, but it's actually the culture and how do we create that? And I think, uh, you know, events like this where, you know, we can see each other face to face and have conversations. Uh, I think platforms like Miro, which we're also using as ways that we can kind of create, uh, let's say a virtual building that, you know, people can walk the halls and kind of have the chance in uh, encounters of looking at the work of other students and looking at each other. Um, but also thinking about things like Slack, where we're kind of introducing a, a kind of virtual chat culture where students are now, you know, we, we started an all uh, graduate architecture Slack channel where students are able to engage with one another, ask questions and not just ask now when they ask questions to their instructors, it's not like one email that gets exchanged back and forth between one instructor and one student. It's actually a chat forum that allows multiple people an entire school if they want to to observe and participate. Um, and then finally, I would say that there's also a sort of uh, opportunity here for people to really take advantage of this uh, virtual culture as a way to have conversations. And so one of the things we've done is changed our, uh, actually, Josh, you took this course with me, uh, 409, the architecture boot camp at yeah. USC, the kind of preterm boot camp which as you remember was a, a, an important sort of introduction to architecture through a kind of boot camp process of learning fundamental skills, but really engaging with one another and really about connecting with your fellow classmates and your faculty. Um, so we've changed that from being a preterm boot camp to being something that's an extended course through the semester, but as a discussion course. So the purpose of the course is actually not to teach anything. It's actually just to talk. And we just have conversations about what they're doing in studio, conversations about what they're doing in, in theory, conversations about what they're doing in uh, computation. And we have these synthetic uh, 
presentations that are basically every week a group of students is asked to do a Pecha Kucha style presentation of just aggregating all the things they're doing in other classes and talking about it. And then we have a conversation about that. And it allows us to really try to have the conversations that we normally would have had in, uh, like the students would normally be having over their desks. Mm -hmm. right? While they're working, they might be talking to each other, but now they don't really get that chance anymore. That's good. Aaron and um, Michael, to close out this this question, because um, you guys kind of talk about the last thing Alvin said about how to create that culture of students being able to interact with one on another. Because um, as Alvin was mentioning in that in that four or nine class, it was where all of our third year, our three year graduate students, um, we got to know each other very well. Um, we didn't sleep for like two weeks, but that, that, that was that was a good way for us to really, really get to know each other. And I think it, it helped us as we got into the semester to be able to feel comfortable to lean on each other when we were having issues where we wanted to give up mentally or issues where some people knew um, Rhino better than someone else and we felt comfortable to be able to ask that. So how, how have um, either of you been able to address that virtually? Aaron, do you want to go ahead and take that first? Sure, uh, happy to. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think like what Alvin and Dahlia have been talking about are like things that we're all in the academic world sort of learning how to do in real time. And so we're implementing programs and seeing what works and what doesn't um, throughout the semester. And the students are uh, going along with us and I'm so grateful for that. Um, we started a buddy system. Um, or a buddy initiative to especially for students who are like entering the program to make sure that they have an upperclassman that they can ask questions to. Um, and we're, we're trying to find ways to have more group projects so students can have that sort of relationship with each other. Um, but I also think like a little bit to touch on what Deja was saying in the earlier panel, um, having these like I think having almost a, as regular studio as possible helps everyone sort of move forward and when time feels so strange in these days like who it, this is like the fastest and slowest time in my life it's nice to have projects that continue to develop throughout the semester and feel like there's some sort of continuous um, progression when sort of the world sometimes seems like it's standing still right now um, so having these communities um, and I think like all of us who have gone to architecture school and have stayed up to like 3 a.m like and seeing each other at our best and worst know that those moments are so important to us in the industry. Um, and like those are the people we talk to at 3 a.m. still maybe. Um, having those systems in place to, to still be able to communicate. I, I love the idea of having a Slack channel. Um, and like it's great to have this forum where I could hear what's happening at different schools across the country. And I, I, like I think that like this also has sort of like leveled sort of playing field. Like we are all going through this really enormous event together. And, and so having that sort of conversation with students where we all know this is something that's gonna affect all of us. Is that, is that right? You ready for me, Aaron? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I have to take a different perspective um, because of who we are and uh, being a two-year program, but I absolutely resonate with the comments. In fact, there, I felt that daily as we started off taking a number of things, I wished I, I would have been able to share. So I share with her, the same with Alvin um, and, and, and now with Aaron, but we're a two-year program. And as a two-year program, um, I, I'm not one to assume because obviously our students whose situations uh, they carry on as they transfer to the next level to say that a university student doesn't suffer the same uh, issues that our uh, community and two-year students do would be would be ludicrous and would would be beneficial to this to this discussion. But the vast majority of our students suffer some level of housing, uh, foods, and other insecurities. The technology issue for us in, in to our students, and again, we're a program that's an open program. So we don't choose our students. Our students come to us with a dream, uh, oftentimes not college bound initially when they come to a school like ELAC or another two year program. And uh, we're trying to uh, replicate. We have articulation MOUs with universities. So that means that our first two years of design studio as Stephen can attest to translate and are, are credited 
Um, many of our students transfer to third year programs, which is an incredible asset and, and an opportunity. And that's why uh, I, I champion our pipeline at ELAC as being a very special place to uh, provide opportunities. But when you don't have access to, activity, uh, to technology, or you're in a family of multiple siblings and you're using one computer, or you're trying to attend a studio with a, your phone, um, and doing the same things that we're talking about, utilizing a Miro, utilizing, you know, all the other technological, you know, abilities to replicate a digital culture of a collaborative physical environment that we're so used to being educated in is very difficult. And this year, I was told as we enter into the fall semester, we started school on Monday. I've been told that we will continue online through the spring semester and we will update our course curriculum. I, as the chair of this program and as a professor and instructor in certain courses, will never physically meet some of my students, the new ones, the freshmen. And these are kids who are coming into college for the very first time, and they're choosing this very unique uh, profession and, and academic uh, methodology. And we champion this methodology as being actually one that actually helps promote educational foundation. Even if they don't stay with us in architecture, we believe that the first couple of your semesters into a design studio using object and project-based learning changes the way a student will look at learning in other disciplines and just changes their trajectory as being a student in general, whether they stay with architecture. But we won't make that connection with them. I may not ever meet a student because they're not in my class. I have to jump in on a Zoom with some other professor or students, but I'm just this little, you know, well, we have a hundred and some odd people here. So I'm looking at a gallery of like eight pictures by ten, nine pictures deep on my studio on, on the size of a postage stamp. That's not connecting. And so the COVID thing on that level hurts us. But as I transition from this comment, I'm also talking about other issues that are happening when it comes to um, the insecurities for the people who don't have the resources. Students don't know what architecture is, and so they're coming in completely unprepared, or they think it's this, and it's not really that. And then there are some exit uh, comments that were stated here about how, this, how our academic uh, curriculum is actually preparing students for the profession. And that's where I think we come in and shine even more especially, because we started off as a, um, I'm finishing up here with this one, Josh. We started off as a vocational program, or 75-year-old program, second oldest in the state of California. And so we maintained a lot of that technology and CTE, but of course we're a transfer oriented as our primary mission, but all that other stuff comes along with it. So practical matters from technical drawing, digital uh, accessibility to our students, as Stephen mentioned. Stephen's been a great ambassador today, by the way. And of course our transfer design studios, um, you know, helps. But anyway, thank you for that. And that's a, that's a perfect, uh, um, uh, uh, transition into the question that I want to ask next was, and I'm hoping for, for the sake of time, we have uh, two uh, of our faculty answer this question. You kind of touched on it, um, Michael. Al almost all of the students describe this gap between uh, school learning and practice. And similar to when I was in school, there's kind of always been this idea that that gap is taken care of by internships. And uh, the reality is that internships are not, it's not equitable, it's not, it's not equal. Um, a lot of, of designers of color um, and minorities have a very difficult time uh, having access to, uh, to internships. So, and we also heard a lot about, uh, you know, the idea of the class professional practice and design and how they compete with each other. Just the fact that it's called professional practice just sounds like, uh, if all of my hours are design and then I'm looking at this class called professional practice, uh, I'm going to pick design. And we had the students, they, they mentioned sustainability. They, sus they mentioned economics. They mentioned policymaking. They're talking about technical ability. They're talking about um, uh, uh, taking care of the homeless. So the things that we maybe used to push aside uh, that was more, you know, kind of real world um, requirements kind of gets to the heart of what we do and why we do it in architecture. And the students are saying, we want to see that integration in our design studio that takes the four hours. It takes the big chunks of our, uh, our credit and units. So uh, my question to uh, the faculty is, what do you all believe is that future integration or things that we could be doing now 
to blend and uh, blend that gap. I know I just finished, but I want to jump on that because this has always been a concern of mine. Historically, you got to ask the question, why is architecture now a five-year curriculum or has been a five-year curriculum? I have a number of generations in my own program. I have a couple of 80-year-old professors that graduated in the 60s. I'm from the early 80s. And when you look at why we're a five-year program, yet we, can, we don't come out. If you come directly out of high school into a university program, as many students even uh, discussed today, um, you don't have the necessary technical skills and, and sort of uh, constructive skills to, to get into an office and work in production, understand how a building comes together. So why are we spending 10 semesters in design studios? Whereas you look at my prior, my example of my older generation professors, they talk about that was a part of their curriculum. So that five years included that. We're spending 10 semesters and we're bringing students out with highly conceptual skills. And I, I'm not discounting the the importance of critical thinking and design process and development. But one of the beautiful things of our program, when we have students who are not college ready, they're spending three to four years with us, unfortunately. That allows them to take these other courses, these technical courses, manual drafting as well, because we want to teach cognitive skills. I think cognitive skills is another loss, even for the digital generation. And then our students are, 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 are also introduced to uh, AutoCAD through Revit and BIM. And that goes alongside with their, you know, creative, their critical thinking and design studios. That's a huge set of additional skill sets when they get to the university level. But now you're taking a student who has to spend in a five-year curriculum, and maybe their transfer was a couple extra years, seven years to gain these skills. And that's, again, it's an equitable issue. If we want to bring in, and, hey, pardon? So it, it, it took me seven to get through the whole schooling, yeah. It, it, well, you're, and yours is a, you have a grad degree, though, Josh. See, yeah. we're talking just a, just a five-year curriculum for, for some of our – and some of our students, like I have – there's one – there's a couple here on, on this panel today, yeah, UCLA or, or Berkeley. So they're getting a four-year degree plus the three to four years they spent with us just preparing to get ready for college, and they still may be looking at a, at a, a grad degree. Then they're looking at uh, the additional uh, internment sh uh, you know, time and so forth to prepare. It's a 12-, 15-year process to become licensed. And you can't work during school. Our kids can't work in, in offices during school. They don't have the time. And if they do, they're having to give the money to the families. We, we have a lot of dynamics that are really unique, but they cross over a lot of generation, a lot of, a, a lot of communities that, you know, we can really, um, you know, get into. But um, I, I'm just sharing that part. Uh, I think we got to bring back some tangible skills at, at, at the university levels um, and bring those in so that students have a better opportunity to be immediately employed. Uh, and also it helps a lot of our kids are, are, are hand workers too. So they want to, they want to be able to, to, to technically, you know, do things and see things, you know, come to life in realistic. Anyway. That's good. If one more of you can tackle that. Um, we have a final question. Um, I can jump in. Um, I mean, outside of the technical integration into design studio, I think there's also an opportunity to maybe strengthen other courses and have them as core courses that deal with some of these um, social justice, environmental justice issues, and then how do those themes then be picked up in studios? So for example, at Howard, we have a required class called Public Issues in Architecture that deals with the students have to go to community meetings, they understand the whole ANC process where um, developers are pitching projects to the community, so they're experiencing that. They go to, in pre-COVID times, that is, they go to Congress um, to, there's bills that they're um, listening to on the floor. Um, they, you know, so they're learning about all of these sort of additional issues outside of the professional practice class that do affect your role as an architect. And they come out of that course kind of understanding their role as an architect in these social environmental justice issues. And I think that starts to get picked up in some of the ways that they approach their studio projects as well. Um, and so that's a required class. Um, and so having more of those sorts of, you know, um, classes that are required outside of the technical requirements and seeing how those can then be picked up in studio, I think there's a lot of opportunity there to kind of create a more well-rounded um, a, a student that's ready for the profession outside of just this one professional practice class. That's good. That's good. I, I really like that idea of having involvement in community meetings and things like that. I, I was able to stumble upon one um, outside of grad school when I was in grad school and it actually really changed my mindset about what I wanted to do when I entered the profession. I, I think that's really good. Um, uh, 
it looked like about six months. Really, yeah. Can I make a really quick comment? Um, I, I I totally agree, and I think that the um, uh, Jessica mentioned in the the first uh, discussion that like you're not going to know everything, and I still feel that way. Like in the profession working, the like architecture is a lifelong learning experience, and the more that we like understand how we learn and pick up tools fast, technology changes, everything sort of adapts as we grow and the field grows. And so I think one of the really important things about the architecture education is to be able to hop onto a project, push it through, and understand. And so I think that's what Studio intends to do. And I, I also like the idea of really incorporating more design build um, classes that Jessica brought up also. Um, but right now in COVID, we had to cancel a bunch of ours. And so how do we, in this new virtual world, like tackle those issues? Um, it's not an answer, it's more a question. Yeah. I think I think that's actually a perfect transition. Um, there there are some questions and things popping up in the chat. Um, I, I think one that's been kind of similar to to a few people um, are asking how can the profession of architecture better support uh, these universities um, and these architecture programs in this new world um, with COVID, um, and then also just figuring out how that disconnect from the profession and student engagement because it's not all on the universities um a lot of the people that are here on this call right now are in practice um they're in companies they're in firms right now so um do any of you faculty have have thoughts or ideas how how we all here on this call can be more helpful i think internships are so important and having internship accessible to uh and paying interns, like, I think that's so important. Um, but also because we're at Woodbury, we have an IPAL program, which is when students graduate after six years with uh, like taking all their licensure exams. And for that, they also need to complete a number of internships and they're not being able to do that um, because uh, industry can't support internships right now. We're a big we're a big believer in internships as long as I've been uh, in academia for 28 years and in the the head of this this program here at ELAC for 15 the consistencies in the internships and when we offer that as a as a product of our curriculum uh, offerings to our students is what needs to to uh, um, there needs to be a stability in that and if the economy ups and down firms can't offer those paid internships which they do they have to be paid like Aaron stated they're very beneficial. Um, and providing that accessibility for our students to see how real firms work. You know, our, a lot of students, as we always talk about, come from neighborhoods where they don't even know what architecture really is. It's, it's hit and miss. That's, that's one of our other big goals is to reach the communities more and really demystify what architecture is. You don't have to be a science and math major. And you can see these different activities that an architect can take on in roles. Not everybody's going to be a designer. Not everybody's going to be a production person. Some people are managers of people. I mean, you see it in personality. Some people are better at working with people and managing them. Others are more, you know, face to the table and designers or producers. Uh, there's so many roles that we can take on. And of course, you know, as a two-year program, we're a fundamental developer. So we also have pathways for inter uh, interiors and industrial design and, and even up through gaming, you know, it's outside of the traditional architectural enterprise. But there's got to be a consistency if it firms want to commit and help with this endeavor, especially in reaching, you know, in, in providing inclusivity and in reaching a diverse population. We have to be able to be consistent. But when economics play a role, sometimes that can't happen. And then that changes our dynamic and they're serving our communities and helping, you know, to get the next generation of architects into the, you know, through the system. That's good. Alvin, it looked like you were about to jump in on that. Well, I was just going to say that one of the things that, um, you know, I do in my practice. And so I, I'm, you know, I have both the practice and I'm, I'm teaching as well or, or, and directing the, the grad program. One of the things that I've done is actually implemented an internal policy for diversity in my own internships or not just internships, but hiring as, as a whole, which isn't just about diversity in the sense of, you know, uh, people of color or gender diversity, but it's actually uh, institutional diversity. And so as somebody who's you know, teaching out of school, I actually put in a policy for myself that I can't have more than one person from the same school. Like I can't keep hiring from the same school. Um, and that keeps me from, you know, 
having an office full of USC students and, um, or an office full of whatever. But I think it helps me not only have uh, address sort of the issues of like, you know, let's say just being all one from one school, but also having a diversity of thought. And I think that's something that also forces me to look at other CVs and look at other people that I normally wouldn't look at. And I think that's something that um, firms really should be taking a look at the, you know, let's say the people, not just the, the, the product, because I think, um, you know, one of the big things with, uh, you know, for myself with hiring is that you're actually hiring the person rather than, than the, the work that they're producing. Because if they've gotten the interview, it means that uh, the portfolio, like everybody I interview then, you know, is their portfolio actually passed the test. Now it's about the person. And, and I think that that's actually one of the things where, you know, when we take into account what the person is and who the person is and what their backgrounds are and how that can feed into the ecosystem of, of what we're doing as a profession. Because I think one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is that, uh, let's say one of the ways that um, the world, not just architecture, tends to treat the issue of diversity right now is that it's a little bit like uh, sprinkles on a cupcake, right? It, it, it's something you just kind of add on top. And I think one of the things that we're seeing very clearly at this moment is that when things are systemic, you can't just cover them up and pretend like they got better. Right. And so we have to kind of rethink and reeducate ourselves in terms of thinking about the DNA of these things. And maybe this as a sort of architectural metaphor, thinking about this like sustainability, right? Like uh, we all know, like lead is, is, is something that, you know, you can achieve without actually really, um, changing the DNA of the building. Like you can actually just add solar panels, add parking, uh, re charging stations, add bicycle parking, add recycle stations and add all these things on top of a building that really wasn't designed with the guts of, of something that was meant to be sustainable. And you can still get lead status. Um, but really profound sustainable design actually improves the design, right? Like it's actually part of the design process and it actually changes the way the building is designed. And I think that's something where we can think about uh, diversity as something that is so, sort of integrative to uh, what we do as a profession and rather than it being additive. And I think that goes a lot to look at um, turning up. Uh, you know, I think I can't get past looking at this crowd that or this group of faces that's on my screen right now and thinking that I wish every architecture event I went to looked like this. Like this is a, a really, beautiful group of diverse spectrum of, of, of faces. And uh, we all know that, uh, you know, AIA membership, I think right now, I was just looking up the numbers. So uh, last, I think AIA diversity uh, study was in 2014. And I think it was 2% uh, of licensed architects are African American. I think uh, AIA members, 37% uh, are uh, people of color, but those in leadership positions, I think it drops to 6%. You know, and so these are all numbers where, you know, like I think representation is something that I think is uh, a really, really, really important thing and something that we don't um, truly always understand uh, the, the power of until you actually, you know, like encounter it or deal with it on a, a kind of firsthand basis. And uh, one of the eye-opening experiences for me was an uh, experience where I had a former student who was uh, a dreamer and he's from uh, El Salvador and uh, was on a full scholarship to USC, was one of my best students. And uh, he ended up taking me out to lunch for this his scholarship. And uh, we went out to lunch and I, I had a chance to get to know him better. And it turned out he actually really struggled the first two years he was at USC and then shined in my studio. And he told me the reason was that I was the first person of color that he had as an instructor. And up until that moment, he had never thought that he belonged. He thought that he was there as a sort of imposter. Like he was there because of his color. He was there because he got a scholarship because of his color. He got his scholarship because of his background. He was smart for his demographic, but not smart for the greater whole. And that moment for him really was, and I'm not talking about that as myself, but as him getting a chance to be exposed to a person of color that was succeeding in the role that he was trying to fit into. And so I think one of the things that we can do as firms, as professionals, as instructors, 
is to acknowledge the fact that we can only teach what we've been taught and what we have been taught is supporting a historically systemically racist and systemically uh, white male dominated canon of architecture. Um, you know, and that, that's one of the things that, again, another sort of story about this, I took a group of students on a tour of, a walking tour of Venice to look at uh, pro significant projects by uh, LA architects along the Venice beach and, and Venice canals. And for the life of me, I could not find one by a woman or a person of color. It was, they're great projects. They're, they're Tom Main, Frank Gehry, Fred Fisher, Lorcan O'Hare, like, like a lot of people I truly admire and truly respect. And so it was a conversation I had with my students where I said, look, I can look at all of your faces, a group of 13 students, and know that not one of you will ever grow up to be a, an old white man. But we're gonna go look at a bunch of buildings by a bunch of old white men and they're really great buildings. And it doesn't mean that they're, it's a problem that they're all by, uh, that, they're, that we're going to go look at all of these. The problem is that we are here to change that. Like we are here to change the fact that in the future people will be going tours that won't just be about old white men. That's good. That's good. I think that that's a really good transition. There's a lot of um, questions coming in the chat and basically all, all of these are coming around the idea of representation and, and diversity. Um, there's a few questions talking about how, how are we able to figure out making, making the diversity and the representation something that doesn't seem as one a handout, um, one that seems as like we really belong because there's also a a sake of making sure students don't come into the program like, like you were saying Alvin where your student thought that he was just the best for for his his people or the best has, has to be the face of, of the race which is something that uh, it's really hard for students to take on um, and then also question being how as faculty or directors of faculty are we able to bring in more representation like actually having professors of color actually having um, guest crits and reviewers of color. Um, I not once in my entire architecture schooling career of seven years been taught by someone that looks like me. And that is a problem. If for seven years, two different universities and not have having that be the case at all. Um, and so we want to kind of see what, what your thoughts are on that. This is, we're going to close out with this in a few minutes. Um, and Daly, if you could start on this, because I know you're looking at it from a different perspective of one, being a professor of color, but also being at a university that, that, that does that. Right. Yeah. So um, I was like you, my education um, in undergrad, um, I didn't have any professors that looked like me and there was no one else actually that looked at me in my undergrad program in grad school same thing I was like there was like a handful of us um, but I was fortunate enough um, to, to have a few professors that looked like me female um, black professors so I was fortunate there and that's actually what um, drew me to teaching at Howard to be able to provide that for other students to be able to um, you know be in that environment where students do have that diversity in their faculty um, but also diversity in the where we are coming from so um, the faculty is quite international we have two Asian professors we have um, I'm from the Caribbean um, we've had other professors that have come to from the Caribbean. So I think that also lends another layer to diversity um, in the faculty because then that tr trickles down into the types of courses that we teach when I know there's been conversations about kind of the Eurocentric um, architecture education. I think having that diversity of the faculty and those experiences has also helped in kind of decolonizing that curriculum. So some of our faculty have taught um, East Asian art and, um, architecture courses. I teach a tropical architecture course. Um, even though we still have our architectural history and theory, which is, you know, covers, it's still very Eurocentric heavy and I know we have, we can improve there. But I think having that diversity of the faculty has helped with some of the other classes to just um, kind of create more exposure to different cultures, um, looking at architecture from different perspectives. So I think there's still improvement, but I, I think um, that's really important, that diversity, not just from 
um, people of color, female architects, but also from that background um, to help decolonize that curriculum. That's good. We have time for one, one more of our faculty to answer this question before we wrap up. Um, I, if it's okay, I'll, I'd like to jump in. Um, I had the pleasure of working with uh, two of the students who were on the previous panel, Khan and Stephanie, this summer on writing. Um, I was mere advisor to this, but they were writing a letter to the administration on things that they wanted to see. And to see them like speak up and ask for what they want to see for their education was like such a powerful experience. And I urge you to uh, look at what a lot of the NOMAS chapters have sent to their administrations. Um, but I also wanted to comment on something that Alvin said. Um, we can only teach what we've been taught, but I think it's our responsibility as educators to also be progressive and to look at the future of the profession, which like we hope to see looks different than the profession that we entered into, um, and to see that sort of evolution happen and to do the research and to put the time in to make sure that we're not just teaching what we, we know, but also teaching what we hope to see. That was great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we wish we can talk a whole nother hour about this. Um, this is definitely something that we hope that our conversation is start to spark some ideas and some thoughts for all that's on on this call and hoping that um, we did a good job at letting our students' voices be, be heard this morning. So thank you for all the panelists. Um, thank you for everyone that's on this call here. I'm going to pass it over to, to Will as he transitions us into our, our next activity. Thank you so much, Joshua and Matthew. Um, and thank you uh, for the distinguished students and faculty members. We're really honored to have you part of this. Um, we're gonna start the next program right at 9.30. So everyone that's here right now, stretch your legs, stand up, uh, clap your hands, um, do your jumping jacks. Um, I really wanna thank the sponsors once again. Uh, in addition to our annual sponsors that really support the chapter throughout the entire year, we are honored to have as Encompass sponsors, our presenting sponsor, Unibel Rodemka Westfield. And the friends of Encompass include ZGF, Penta Building uh, Corporation, and Steinberg Hart. And our participating sponsors are HKS, KFA, NAC Architecture, PCL Construction Services, Hanson LA, Bernard's, and Co-Architects. It's with the support of those firms and firms such as our annual sponsors that really help us, the AIA Los Angeles, deliver programming like this. And we're quite honored to have uh, the support from the architecture and design community. Um, as we sort of wait for the 930 panel to begin, uh, you know, I encourage you all to become a, a part of the newly launched AIA LA and SoCal NOMA JEDI com Committee. Uh, Joshua, Zeba, Janelle, and Leslie are all co-chairs or they're helping form that programming. We'll have uh, you know, monthly programs from the JEDI Committee and uh, I highly encourage you to get involved. Also next week on September 8th, the AIA LA Practice Committee is having um, a panel discussion that really talks about how do we attract more youth into the architecture profession for this exact reason that we need to diversify the architecture community. Um, with that, we have about one minute to go. I'm hoping that you're getting in all your exercise. And in, in the meantime, uh, I'm gonna welcome to the screen, Janice and Don. And if you uh, can both sort of get your um, microphones on and we'll do a little test run. Uh, look forward to the program starting right now. So Janice and Don, panel number four, you're on, you're on the line. We're here. Excellent. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Can y'all hear us okay? Thumbs up. I know we're all on mute, so I'm talking to a, <laughs> to a screen. Um, okay, so welcome. Welcome, everyone. We're glad to see you still hanging in there with us. Um, we are closing our panel out today. It's not really a panel. We're taking a little bit of a different format, but um, you know, we're really looking for this uh, session to be very engaging. So we want to 
see your faces. We want to hear from you. So we are going to encourage you to turn your cameras on um, so that we can, of course, associate the voice with your beautiful faces. Uh, so I guess we can start with introductions. My name is Janice Williams. I am the Director of Operations at Hanson LA. I am also a, the Board Secretary for SoCal NOMA. Oh, sorry, that would be me. <laughs> um, <Yeah>. so I'm, <laughs> I'm Dawn Hicks. I am the Enterprise Rose Fellow for Venice Community Housing, which is a nonprofit affordable housing developer. Um, in a three-year fellowship with them. I am also um, on the SoCal NOMA board as the treasurer. And so we wanted to just take a few couple minutes um, early on to just introduce what our session is about. Um, and so we hope that you had a chance to at least read the bio on the Encompass page. Um, and our title for the session was Take Action, Exploring Next Steps for Imp Implementation. And so I'm going to be very transparent with you all. I've been working on this and being very vulnerable in all of these conversations. And to be quite frank, you know, when we talk about diversity and inclusion and I think about how it makes me feel and what I wanna do about it, it feels like a lot of pressure. And that's me coming from, you know, the standpoint of being a black woman in this industry, um, not really knowing exactly how I wanted to navigate my career through this industry, now being in a leadership position, um, and really wanting to make sure that I'm playing an integral role in implementation and, real, and seeing real change. And so me and Don talk a lot about this, but I spent a lot of time researching this. I read, I watch lectures, I'm watching interviews because, you know, I take a lot of this pressure on. This is a lot just self-inflicted because I feel like I need to be very, you know, educated on this topic and informed and I want to be a leader in this conversation. Um, so I do pay a lot of attention to comments and opposing views um, because these are all very real things for us to consider knowing that you know what's out there is what's really reflecting the thoughts of people that we surround ourselves with especially knowing that we spend so much time at, at work right a third of our lives is dealing with our coworkers and the people that we're around um so we decided to take a look at you know when we think about implementation you know we've been on panels we've talked we've heard we've marched we've you know expressed ourselves, we've cried, everything. And now we're thinking about what do we do next? Um, and one of the things that really resonates with me personally is trying to figure out, you know, how to make this matter to people, to everyone. And, you know, a lot of times I can feel very alone in this sort of fight. And even being surrounded with 148 people on this call, it's still feeling like what happens when we all hang up? and go back to our regular everyday lives. So I was gonna read a, a quick snippet from the intro to just kind of set the tone for exactly how our, how our session is going to go. So it reads, while considering ways to implement greater diversity in our businesses, we must ask ourselves, how do we keep the momentum going? As we explore the impacts of diversity on the industry pipeline, we have to consider approaching implementation from various angles. When you think about the longstanding work that needs to be done in order to see real change, how can firms continue to keep this at the forefront of their strategic planning? How will this continue to appeal to all professionals from the recent graduates to the principals and the CEOs? And so, you know, just to sort of kind of touch on that a little bit, I think many of us on this call can probably attest to being a part of the company's that are quick to throw money at diversity and inclusion and you know they'll say oh we support it and we stand in partnership um they hire a diversity officer i'm still educating myself on what that really means focusing on recruiting efforts you know training the words unconscious bias are constantly being thrown at thrown at us and trying to figure out how is that really affecting any sort of change um but we also need to be very cognizant that firm leaders may not realize that there is a true fear of speaking up for many people at various levels within their firm. 
So how do we support our teams? How do we support each other? Um, and really what we want to get out of this as far as our objectives is to, you know, really establish a safe space for collaborating and thinking and doing across this industry. We want to encourage support and diversity of thought amongst our colleagues. We want to have these conversations appeal to people at all levels of the industry pipeline. You know, just knowing that in order to reach our leaders, sometimes it does start with our associate level and recent graduates. And we really just want to get to the roots of long-term change and long-term effects of DEI engagement and strategies. So the two questions that we initially put out there um, was what is the business case for diversity, equity, inclusion, and what is the design case for diversity, equity, inclusion? And these are two, two questions that many of you have probably been asked. We think about it all the time. How do we approach it within our firms? How do we position it to our leadership? Uh, for those who are in leadership positions, how do we answer the question ourselves? And so thank you to those who did uh, send us some responses um, prior to the start of Encompass. So we did take your responses into consideration and we use this to really sort of help um, guide what we want the um, sort of poll questions that we're going to set up for you all to respond to, to just really get a feel for how, you know, everyone is feeling about how to respond to these questions. So, um, you know, we think about the design case and a lot of us can probably already sort of think about you know, the design case and be in unison on how we feel like the design case impacts DEI. But the business case is a little tricky. And, you know, we wanted to take this time to focus on more so the business case and how people really respond to that. Um, so what we're going to do is launch a series of poll questions and we want everyone to answer the poll questions and we'll use the responses to the poll questions to just sort of help guide our conversation. So Don will be paying, Don and I will be paying attention to the chat and as well as the raise your hand tool, we're gonna encourage everyone to use the raise your hand tool. So after we review the responses and see what our results are from each poll question, we'll take maybe two or three responses um, for anyone who would like to sort of elaborate on how they feel or what their response to that question may be. Okay, so Kareem, could we launch the first poll question, please? Okay, so the business case for DEI efforts is related to which one of these options listed? Profit margins, business development, company relevance to clients and communities, talent retention, all the above, or an alternate answer not listed. Now there's no right or wrong answer here, just whatever you feel, please select your response. And we just wanted to really get an idea of how people define the business case for diversity, equity, inclusion? Like what category does this really apply to? Um, you know, is it really speaking to a problem? With, when we think of business and having to solve a problem, right? We think of real problems, real numbers, real consequences. How does that really connect? So we'll give people a chance to, to get their answers in. No way. Heard about 50, almost 60%. <laughs> okay. What were we going to say, Don? No, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, you can see it too. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I forgot you could see no, it. Okay. <laughs> All good. Technology. Uh, All right. I think we should close it in five seconds. Okay. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, interesting. So a good majority of the people, 58% said all of the above. Um, interesting. I'm actually kind of curious to see what the 4% said for the alternate answer not listed. Once again, this is not a like right or wrong answer here, but I am curious to how people associate the business uh, case for DEI. So do we have anybody who would like to expound on that, um, explaining why they chose the answer that they chose? You can also use the raise your hand tool. And I guess I can, go ahead. No, I was gonna say use the raise your hand tool and we can just pick like a couple, like one or two people who answered that um, alternate answer. 
Yes. Don't if anyone wants that. to expand <laughs> on that. <laughs> yeah. And just, this is Will Wright, just to sort of encourage the 153 people we do have in the room. Um, this is your moment to shine. So please engage <laughs> with us. If you're asleep at yes. the wheel, then uh, we'll be more coffee. <laughs> yes, we definitely want to encourage engagement. And, you know, like I said, I can set the tone a little bit for this because I've been researching and reading and I hear a lot of different sort of opposing views to why there should or shouldn't be a business case um, and, you know, how businesses should approach the thought of DEI. So we really want to hear from our peers. Um, and if you can raise your hand, if you can use the raise your hand tool in the um, participants, because it's hard to see if you actually raise your hand in the, <laughs> like, use it, that the hand that comes up on the screen is hard to see. So if you can <laughs> use the raise your hand tool, that's um, when you click on participants over that side, it's easier for us to see. Um, so yes. we do have oh, one, we have um, Karen Compton. Ms. Compton, you can unmute yourself. So while I do think that it is a combination of all four, <clears throat> all four things, I was the one who said that it's about profits because the people on this call are very like-minded and we all agree, at least in concept, that we need to move forward. But there are a number of people that are not on this call and unless we can figure out a strategy that gets them to understand how to move this conversation beyond um, where they are. Uh, the truth of the matter is for them, it is about profit. Um, I've had the misfortune or fortune in my career to sit in a lot of those rooms. And a lot of the conversation is about how much do I get to keep, not about how much do I get to equitably invest in others. And so I do believe that the genesis of the conversation has to start there and then roll up. The other things I do completely agree with, but I just wanted to clarify my pick one choice. Thank you, Karen, for that. And a, a great point that you bring up, um, especially because, you know, as I was describing, um, using these sort of tools and resources that I've been exploring and I feel like I'm doing my own dissertation on how to respond to DEI. One of the things that um, someone brought up was, or at least that I found in my research is that, you know, when we associate metrics and sort of profitability or what um, revenue increases could be associated with DEI, are those really true um, metrics? Are those really true results? Or does that potentially add sort of another layer of um, sort of uh, expectation that is put on those people who we should be advocating for? Like now, once, you know, there are efforts to DEI and increasing, you know, representation, like are those people expected to perform or meet some type of profit margin or quota? Or what do you think sort of that response could be to, to counter that? You know, I, again, my experience is, and I believe it's Toni Morrison that said that racism will continue to exist until it is no longer financially profitable or psychologically useful. And unless or until we can make a business case that gets to the financial profitability issue and understands, uh, recognizes that we have to create that financial impact in order for people to shift or change or truly invest in DEI, then I, I'm afraid personally, just like I said, having sat in a number of conversations, I'm concerned that we're just circling the drain. Mm. And I'm glad you made that point too and said that quote because someone in the, that responded to the questions um, that we sent out you know, earlier, one of her, the comment was a concern about like uh, firm owners being um, their concern over how much, how much money they were spending for resources for DEI, mm -hmm. right? So I thought that was really interesting and alarming, a little disturbing, you know, that that's a thought that comes up that is, um, you know, we, we may not have enough money as a firm to invest in um, researching and resources and, and, and having design and equity. And, 
you know, that's, that's a, a issue in itself. So I'm glad you said that quote, because that was a point that someone made um, in their comments for, when they answered the question. And that's something that, you know, I was telling Janice last night that I never thought, you know, people don't, you don't think that, oh, I can't do this because I don't have the money, but it's the right thing to do. So what, <laughs> why is that? We all up? want, I think everybody on this call wants to do the right thing. My experience is that not everybody is willing to invest. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes an excuse. Um, my, my personal passion at this point is pushing the owners to require this because if the owner requires it, then the firm follows. So I, as much as I would love to believe that, that people are interested in the greater good and that they want to do the greater good, a lot of people do, but there are a lot of people who are really concerned about how much of it do I still get to keep. So that equity of, of sharing and equity of distribution isn't going to become impacted until I can get the owner side of the equation to demand and push. And I think that's why there's been so much conversation around um, Prop 16 and around other initiatives to try and get the push on the other side because then it doesn't really matter how much you have to invest in DEI. You're going to do it because it's a profit case. Right. Exactly. So we'll take two. We have two more hands. That's a great. Thank you so much for that, Karen, and kicking us off in the discussion. Sorry. <laughs> no, that is great. So we have two more hands that we'll go to um, Craig and then Ronell, and then we can go to the. Um, the next poll question. Well, uh, so, yeah, yeah. So, so Karen and I are good friends, and it's kind of funny. I texted her. I said she had to bring up money, didn't she? Um, so, what I want to say is, in, in all this, I think in the end, just because I'm black, that doesn't mean I don't have to run a profitable practice. And so, I think people have to understand that what we're talking about, right? And, and, and what we're saying here, and what she's saying is, is that I'm, I'm blessed to be working for, I've got a president and CEO that are really passionate about this issue, but I'm still, the other call I'm gonna have is, what is it gonna cost us? What are your recommendations? What are we gonna do? And to find the right place to create the most impact. And I, Janice, for sure am, and I think you know me from the stuff that we do with NOMA, to me, it's about having our people as well as our money invested in this, in this, um, having, as well as our people invested in this. So, so at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we're still practices that have to make money. So that is, that is true. And we have to find the balance between doing what's right, right, and doing, and, and, and creating uh, diversity and inclusion. For me, my practice has always been run that way because I see value in it. I see value in creating better design. I see value in creating a better workplace. I see value. And even the CEO of our company sat with my team one day and said, wow, I'm just amazed at the diversity of your team. And yeah, because as an individual, it's important to me. So, and I've been able to run my practice without a lot, you know, with a lot of autonomy. So I think it's really getting individuals to understand at a base level that this is important, right? That it's better it's better design, it's better collaboration, it's a better work environment. And what I moved in is all of the young people and the young people that are in school on this call. Um, and I think I've said this before, 30 years later, the, the things that I ran into as a young black man on a campus with less than 1% black, who by the way, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo still is less than 1% black, um, they're running into the same issues. And that's what we have to stop, right? I had a professor, that told me, I wasn't even in his class, told me I'd never make it in architecture. He said, I, you won't make it, you're, you're not good enough, but he didn't even know me, right? So what was the basis? I don't know the basis of his, as, of his, of his talk, but, but, but here I sit. So at the end of the day, we have to find a way to support each other to make this important and to also make it a good business case. And I think there are, there are good business cases for it. Thank you, Craig. Yeah, I'll go ahead and just hop right in. Um, one of the things that I feel like there's a disconnection to is government funding for these type of initiatives. Um, we'll put in Prop 16. I think that that was a perfect 
kind of segue to really looking at the role that government plays in addressing the disparities around diversity in the field of architecture. Um, I believe that the government has played a vital role in creating the problem that we're dealing with with um, uh, redlining zoning policies that uh, affected academic and educational outcomes, economic outcomes in regards to how people were hired and so on and so forth. With that being said, I feel that there needs to be more incentive to hire people for diversity because there has been historically incentive to be discriminatory in practices, in hiring, and things of that nature. There were incentives for that. Um, also, we have to look at incentives and entitlements that have been facilitated by the government for white folks, right? To get them the houses that they have, to get them the suburban neighborhoods that they have and things of that nature. So I think we have to take a critical look at the way that government has supported different um, economic, academic uh, aspects of the circumstance and issue that we're dealing with and really f find ways to uh, look at entitlements and incentives for architecture firms, developers, and so on and so forth, um, and get the government to have a vested interest in addressing the problem that they created through a lot of policy. And, and one of the things that I want to speak on is the amount of investment it took to create this problem. There was millions and billions of dollars flooded into industry, into policy, into lobbying to make a disadvantage for uh, people of color, for, for people trying to pursue education. Affirmative action was presented as like a handout versus um, a, a, a response to the inequity that was built into the fabric of our nation. And I think oftentimes when we look at ways to help people impacted by the flaws of our community, we introduce it in a way that reflects badly on the impacted people versus really call out the discriminate, discrimination um, in, in a deliberate disenfranchisement that was facilitated upon them that creates the circumstance in which they do have to access programs like affirmative action and or uh, lean on diversity, equity, inclusion focuses to uh, acquire their dream of success or attainment of career goals that should be accessible to everyone, no matter what their race are, no matter where they live. But there's fabric built into our country that has facilitated these negative outcomes. And we have to do more investment in addressing that, that is, is met with the amount of investment that created the problem. Thank you, Ronnell. I appreciate that. Okay, I wanted to um, sort of segue because I, I had a feeling this would happen, which is great. Uh, but Corrine, if it isn't too much trouble, I would like to go ahead and skip down to our question three to launch the poll. Would that be okay? Here we go. All right. Who should hold the firm leaders accountable for DEI efforts? And there very well may be a, you know, an answer that is not on here. So we are still encouraging everyone to expound upon their response. Uh, but you know, we often talk about this word accountability that gets thrown around a lot when we think about DEI efforts. But you know, if everything starts with the top and the leaders and the CEOs, who is ultimately holding them accountable? How are we looking on our responses, Don? We're at fifty percent. So we'll add a minute. So we'll give you guys about thirty seconds. Okay. We encourage everyone to to answer the question. <laughs> we're at one hundred and four <laughs> yeah. people. So fifteen seconds. Thank this is a tight race. I know. <laughs> Vote, people. Come on. <laughs> Five seconds. Three, two, one. Let's see. All right. There you go. 
Interesting. Okay. Employees, mm-hmm. clients, AIA, NOMA. <laughs> We're leaving our NOMA pressure a little bit. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, I would be curious to hear some of your thoughts on um, not only who should hold them accountable, but um, you know, how do we hold them accountable? Um, especially, you know, it's great that we are able to sort of collaborate across um, experience levels and, um, you know, just position levels within our firms. But, you know, we, we are looking to people who have either been in these positions before or, you know, have some experience in this realm to sort of help guide that conversation for people who are uh, developing professionals and coming up through this industry. So uh, let's start with Matthew Trotter. Um, Matthew, your sound. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Sorry, I had myself muted here as well. Um, I selected employees. Um, change has to come from within. Um, you can uh, lobby for someone to make a choice. You can encourage them uh, to do this or that. But true change and um, you know comes from within. So the firm should be holding itself accountable. Um, and, you know, as architects, we should be, um, educating our clients. It's similar to sustainability. You know, you're, you know, at the end of the day, the client is going to, uh, make a decision on the, uh, the range or the limit of sustainable efforts that are going to be put into the project because they're putting forth the money. Um, But at the same time, we're supposed to be advocates for sustainability. We're supposed to be advocates for um, doing the right thing. So if we're not making that change within ourselves, um, you know, how do we expect someone else, you know, no one's, no one's going to hold your hand into, into change. I think the other groups like NOMA and the AIA, they are there for support. Um, they are a medium in which they can help facilitate change uh, uh, and, and, and reach out and say, okay, we've got the Encompass Conference, we've got the DEI Challenge, we've got uh, uh, the summer camps uh, that you can volunteer and all of these different type of programs that firms can access uh, the African American, you know, architect list to, you know, all of these opportunities to affect change, but your firm has to hold itself accountable for what, what of those kind of opportunities they're going to participate in. And then part of the second question is how, how do you hold your firm accountable? It's recognizing that there's an issue. And I think that the employees the employees can't is, is are going to have a difficult time in holding the firm accountable if at the top of the firm or at the leadership level there isn't a, there isn't a recognition of an issue, and um, there isn't a culture built up so that that this is this is uh, a way that employees can ex- can express themselves, and so. Um, I, I, we've heard from many other firms, groups that have been created, um, uh, groups that have been created at Perkins and Will, um, at Cunningham Group. I created a NOMAD CGA committee, and we have, we've pulled together all of our NOMA members from all of our offices across America, and we meet once a month, and we have become advisors to our board and to leadership. It's created a platform for D1s, D2s. These are, these are people who are not necessarily principals, but now, they have be, now there's a platform created within the firm where they have the ability to advise the president of the company. They have the ability to reach out and talk to um, the people who are, are making the decisions. And I believe that that's really important to ingrain that in the culture. So the leadership, you've got to go, I'm going to allow someone else to hold me accountable. You've got to make that choice. And it's a, it's a difficult one, but it's one that has to happen if you really 
want to move forward in the right direction. You're going to hear the hard stuff. Um, and it actually becomes quite fun and exciting to be able to, to move forward in a way where you're increasing value. Because all of, back to the first poll question, all of those things that you had written down, Janice and Don, create the profit margin. I think we'll place that in the chat as well. All of these things lead to greater value in your work, which means greater opportunities. So. Great point, Matthew. Thank you. And when we do have a few hands raised um, and we're not going to get to everybody, but we would encourage folks to write things in the chat because we're going to save the chat. The question is how um, do, do we hold firm owners accountable um, to do these things? So please feel free to, to write responses in the chat as well, because this will also be saved. Um, Zeba. Let me unmute myself. Um, hi, Ziba Gisemi with URW. Uh, I actually uh, picked client and I do agree with everything that Matthew said that, you know, we are all personally accountable and we, you know, have to do our own part. But at the same time, I feel that, especially because I come from a client side, and uh, for the 16 years that I've been with URW, uh, I've seen the benefits and I've seen the value of working with diverse group. And because, you know, we are very multidisciplinary and uh, you, you experience diversity in many different ways. Uh, and we see the value of that, the value of in, in terms of like creativity, uh, you know, how, like approaching project is it's it's quite different so um i pick client because i think that's where the buck stops and i've been probably fortunate that urw have uh measures and uh and metrics already you know in place and resources that we are actually really do pay attention to who we are working with. And that is gonna be more and more uh, part of the system as we are going forward. So I feel that there should be more advocacy, there should be more awareness, and there should be more, uh, more laws and regulation gone into holding clients accountable to make sure that who they are working with, it's, it's going to be a diverse team, that there are requirements with that. Because then, you know, you, you may have individuals that are in a position that they, they are, they may be in a position that they can really actually stand up and say, this is wrong. So you can't really expect that everybody can just stop this and they're going to, uh, you know, take an action and they're going to hold their firms accountable. So I think at that very top level, there should be accountability, number one accountability. So that's, that's what I think. Thank you, Ziba. Um, Karen, Karen Compton. So the average architectural practice has less than 50 employees. I know there are large firms that are represented on this call, um, but the average firm has less than 50 employees and it does not typically have a human resources manager. I think it's worth noting that um, I, I feel that the AIA needs to do more because in a smaller firm, whether you have 50 employees, 25 employees or less, less much to Matthew's uh, point a little bit earlier, um, it's very, very difficult for um, uh, individuals in smaller firms, mid-sized firms, uh, to be able to seek any kind of adjudication around justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion issues within their own organizations unless the, unless the top of the organization sees that there's an issue and that they want to change. As a sidebar, I actually advise one of the oldest architectural practices, uh, about 85% white, um, in a southern state, 
And they, uh, even though their, their emerging leadership sees this as an issue, the top is not willing to concede. And so it is, it is almost impossible to make any kind of long-term change in that particular firm uh, without support or pressure from outside. Now that pressure can come from the client side, as Ziba just indicated, or it can come from AIA looking at their ethics and saying, hey, what do we really need to do in our ethics standards to hold firms more accountable for being part of this membership? Excellent point. Um, Don, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I thought you were getting ready to. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, if we wanted to take one more right now before we jump to our next question. So Alec Zarifian, hope I said your name correctly. Would you like to unmute yourself? Alec, are you there? It doesn't look like his okay. audio is connected. Oh, maybe not. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Craig, I, I know you had your hand raised, but did you still want to make your, your point before we jump to the next question? Uh, no, I, I kind of put it in the chat, but I, I, okay. I, kind of, I kind of agreed with Matthew, but for a different reason. Let's hear it. <laughs> well, um, our task force right now, oh, just broke one pair of reading glasses. Um, my, um, my point to our group as we, as we go in our task force that um, diversity, equity, and inclusion is, is essentially creating a diverse and culturally diverse workplace it's good for the workplace culture, right? We, we were designed to be a diverse society and I think it's just a good thing. The reason I put employees is because I think one of the things that affects business is high turnover, right? And I think those businesses that have this better culture um, have, have less turnover. So one of the goals of our task force is to create a culture that will make us an employer as a destination of choice. Right, people will seek us out to come to work because they know we're that kind of organization. So for me, why I said employees, it's not only the people that we have in-house and we are taking a good hard look at ourselves, but it's the people that are looking to work for us and the people that, and I feel like it's just an environment that, that the very best talent will seek us out and make us better, right? So there's the business case of just attracting the very best talent and people wanting to come work for you and why wouldn't you want to do what's right and so for me it's it's similar i think to what matthew said but it takes a different spin on why i i checked employees absolutely thank you for that craig um and we wanted to go ahead and launch our next poll question um kareem could you launch poll question number four please um so, sorry this is alec uh, i i just managed to make my audio work Oh, okay. But maybe I'll talk later. No, that's, uh, yeah, how about we save it after the poll question and then we can, we can sure. take your point if that's okay. Great, all right, so the poll question is, should farm leaders experience real consequences if they don't do what they are accountable for regarding DEI? So sort of the background behind this question is when we think about us and our roles, right we are all held to some level of accountability within our job titles our job descriptions we're expected to perform in some form or fashion to meet the expectations um, when we have our own reviews so when we think about those dei efforts and that being sort of at the forefront of how we are measuring ability within our leadership how are our leaders now expected to experience those consequences just as if you know, if we weren't performing in our roles, you know, we get a first maybe sort of tap on the shoulder, like what can the firm do to help us support, to help support us? Or, you know, after we get that tap on the shoulder, then maybe we get some extra training to help secure that. But when you get to that next level, then sort of, okay, if we're holding them accountable and they're not measuring up, then should they be experiencing some consequences, whatever they may be? So we wanted to see what your take on that was from our from our audience here. Let's hear it. 
50, 60%. So we'll just give it a few more seconds since we started this one early. 10 seconds. Five seconds. Two, one. All right. Yes. All right. And we have some in the middle folks. Hmm. All right. Who wants to take this on? Alec, we could start with you if you would like, um, if, even if your point wasn't directly associated with this question. Yeah, I, I, think, I think probably it is. Um, you know, when we, every time we talk about accountability, uh, to me, it feels like it's something, we're talking about something that needs to be imposed rather than come naturally. And my ideal is something that should eventually uh, be part of our DNA as a society. Uh, and the reason I'm saying that is because I think, I think this has to do with everything that was talked about in this last two days, uh, because it's an issue about uh, education where um, uh, the, the society needs to be educated to the point that everyone understands the bigger value of uh, why there should be diversity and and we have to reach the point that everyone understands that the true beneficiary is the society itself, not a firm or, or someone that has to, um, there has to be a monetary reason for that. That, I think, to me, when there is, we, it's connected to a, a benefit that uh, is connected to money, makes it uh, somewhat temporary to me because once that issue is taken out that money uh, and benefit uh, monetary benefit disappears there will go the the need for it and i think it has to maybe take a generation or two as we know uh, to get to a point that it becomes part of the way we think and part of the way we value our lives thank you alex for your response Uh, let's see, we have Joshua Foster. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm one of the people that I put in the middle. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of on both sides with it in the sense where I definitely think that uh, firms and executives need to be held accountable for not, for, for not deciding to take, take part in what's, in what's needed to be done. But on, on a certain or an extent, I think, yes, it is important, whether it comes from the government end of things for incentives and policies, some things that um, I see Ryan L was putting in on the chat is very important. Um, but it comes to the other side of as an employee, would you really want to work for someone that only decides to do these things just because they got a slap on, on the hand? And me personally, I, I frankly wouldn't. And, and I think that we should as employees hold them accountable, kind of going back to one of the first first questions where we need to figure out how we can have the agency to be able to say, I'm not going to work for someone who doesn't truly believe that this is important. And that in itself is a consequence where people start leaving their firm. If people start not hiring them to be able to do things, um, to be able to have, have winning RFPs or to be able to have different things like that, if people see this firm come up and be like, oh, this is this is a firm that we, we know does not care about diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're not going to work with them. And so I think the consequence should come from the employees in the sense where be vocal about it. Don't, don't hide the fact that if you work at a company where you feel like they are purposely or deciding not to take in into account what needs to be done, be vocal about it. Talk to talk to uh, other people that are in the industry, talk to people that are looking to apply there. I mean, frankly, if, if the company decides that they don't care enough to do it, then they also seem like they don't care if they're going to be attracting or keeping people that actually care about those values as well. And I know it's easier said than done, especially in the time we are with COVID where it, we should be grateful to have a job, but that, that needs to end soon that we're just grateful to be working. We need to make sure we're working in a place that actually looks, looks like they're making an effort in, internally. 
Josh, that's an excellent point. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, and especially I want to uh, sort of emphasize that to the developing professionals or recent graduates because, you know, we may be feeling the fear of even how to hold the firm leaders accountable, how to bring things up when you're in meetings or, or on calls or make suggestions. And, you know, I think that really is a consequence. It's like, if you ask yourself, is this a company I want to work for? I'm not really seeing the initiative on their part. Oh, but they're quick to say, you know, yeah, go ahead, Janice, start that DEI initiative or start that program. We'll support you. It's like, no, not only support me, don't stand behind me, but also help lead and stand in front of me and, and walk with me as we try to achieve this. So I think it's, it's really important to say that, you know, our talent does not, you know, go undervalued in that way. And we have to be very cognizant of what our worth is and our representation at these firms. And I think that is ultimately what a consequence could be like or what it, what it could represent coming from an employee that is holding a firm accountable. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, our next question or comment was from H. Felsberg. I see a hand raised. So, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can. So, so um, we have a we have a thirty person firm, so it is considered mid size, and I do believe the leadership should be held accountable. I'm a co leader, a co owner, and um, we do have a Jedi committee. But if, like you said earlier, Janice, if um, if an employee is subject to a positive and negative response, uh, why shouldn't the, the leadership? And how else are we going to be setting examples? And how else are we going to be moving anything forward? So in our office, we fully, or I fully take responsibility. But, the, but what's interesting, and I say this humbly, is that the committee is, is accepting mistakes. We make mistakes along the way, but we're learning from them. And we also accept that this is not a, as said earlier, a um, something that we're doing just to um, take care of it at this time. We're we're in it for the long run, so we also accept that we're going to be making mistakes and learning for the long run. And in that regard, it's it makes it more uh, acceptable to take responsibility in the leadership role, and that allows us to actually um, be taught and taught the same kind of example throughout makes it a much better community. So I agree leaders do have to take responsibility. Great, thank you for that. And I also, um, Ronell put something in the comments that I wanted to comment on because as a, working as a developer is really um, opened my eyes to a lot of things, right? It's a little different from working in an architecture firm, but he put in about the government also holding um, these, like, holding firms accountable. I know one thing, you know, we get incentives for affordable housing um, if we do an 100% affordable housing project. So how, how can we do those same things with architecture firm? You get in, incentives from them doing projects um, in certain neighborhoods. But again, that goes back to who is monitoring these things and um, it, it can become tricky, but how do we make it so it's meaningful, right? Um, so I did want to just kind of point that out. That was a little different from what um, other folks were kind of mentioning with employees and AIA. Um, so that was one comment that was that was in the in the chat section about also looking to the the government in in lo other localities where these developments and projects are happening. Um, okay, so we're going to go to the, this is going to be our last question of discussion, and then we're going to kind of rapid fire three um, questions for you all to, to close out the session. So, um, Corrine, if you can do number six. Sorry, I just want to make sure six is the, because um, it was, a, is that the critical mass question or the majority leaders question? Majority leaders. Okay.
Um, okay, so this question is about how do we make this matter to majority leaders? So we kind of touched on this a little bit, but wanted to go into, into further details about, um, you know, to whom this may not directly reflect or impact their everyday experiences. So provide a strong business case, provide a strong design case, humanize this conversation, all of the above or none of the above. So we're about 50%, 53. Eight, we'll just give maybe about 20 more seconds. Fifteen. Ten seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. All right. Okay, these are, yeah, this is great. Um, so it looks like majority of the people said all of the above. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's kind of good to see it uh, sort of in this format, because I think the thing that we have to sort of take away from this conversation is realizing that there is not one approach to this. You know, there's not one lane to figure out how to approach your leadership or how to, to affect real change. Um, so for some, what, what may work for some firms may work, work differently for other firms or may not work for other firms. So um, I'd be curious to hear a little bit about maybe what some of your personal experiences may be for either how you've approached uh, the leadership or if you're in a leadership position, how you've approached it to the rest of your teams, um, whether it's the business case, the design case, or just, you know, humanizing the conversation around it and, and really uh, making people feel um, vulnerable and like we can all be on a level playing field with that. Um, so, Karen, did you want to uh, elaborate on that? I saw your hand raised. It may have been for the last question, so our apologies. Um, actually, I, I wanted just a thought. Um, I do think that there is an opportunity here to explore intersectionality. Um, the intersection between uh, people of color and other disparate groups, including women, um, and bring the entire conversation along as a journey and an exploration of equity for everyone. That's, what, that's my um, interpretation of humanization. I think if we continue, uh, in order for this to be really effective, I really think we're going to have to intersect with other groups and bring other people along in this struggle um, so that there are more people that kind of raise and lift the conversation and place more, I don't wanna say stress, but certainly more impact on the top of the equation that really do not want to change. Thank you. Um, do we have anyone else who would like to respond to that? Or add a comment? Okay. Um, if not, these are all very, oh, Ronnell, was that you? Sorry. Yeah, I, it <laughs> okay, was Okay, I see it. Um, okay. I'll go ahead and go hop ahead. in there. This is kind of a shameless plug, so forgive me. Um, I have an organization, Growing Greatness, and we do diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings specifically to address implicit bias in organizations. Um, I believe that this is something that definitely needs to be done to create common grounding around like lived experiences of communities but also lived experience of staff. I think a lot of times we are talking about how to impact impacted communities before we address impacted staff and empower impacted staff um, and really take an inner internal look in these small to mid-sized organizations around how does this reflect in the way that the organization does business? How does the organization's values of equity and inclusion reflect in their staffing and their promotion opportunity and their board um, 
what their board looks like, you know, their management and things of that nature. There's a critical analysis that needs to be done, but there's a facilitated training that needs to happen so that common grounding, that common understanding can be established. Growing Greatness facilitates those trainings. I think it definitely needs to be an outside person. A lot of times, if you're trying to do it internally, you don't have the capacity. A lot of times these design firms are experts at design, right? But not really experts at implicit bias or the connections to how policy historically has uh, created a lot of these outcomes that they're currently facilitating. So I think the training component, diversity, equity, inclusion component for that common grounding and understanding, and then the material change component to make sure that the policies, the values, and the practices of the organization reflects diversity, equity, and inclusion. Because a lot of times these conversations get stuck in conversation and are not applied to the practices, policies, and um, values that are represented. It's like, oh, we addressed it in that that conversation we had last last year isn't everything okay now it's like no because you just had me train the person that you hired and I wanted that job you know what I mean so it's like there's these real lived experiences that do not reflect authenticity and the values that a lot of these companies say they have and um the training that I facilitate makes a material change to make sure that that is actually a lived experience for not only the staff and the so that that can translate to the impact that you're trying to make on communities. Thank you for sharing that. Let's take one more from Matthew Trotter and then um, we'll get ready to launch the last three rapid fire questions um, to get your responses before we close out today's session. I'll keep this uh, very short. I just wanted to quickly say that um, it's pretty apparent in our last session and just kind of in my own life experience, and I think a lot of other firms have been experiencing this as well, is that the new generation is different. Um, your next wave of employees are nothing like they were, you know, six, seven years ago. Um, the, the time of, you know, employees just taking a beating and accepting that architecture is um, this, you know, place where you get paid extremely low and you're expected to work ridiculous hours and have no work-life balance and not be concerned with diversity and sustainability is, is over. Um, it may have worked for my generation, but it's not going to work for the next. And so it's better to do the work now um, before you literally cannot retain any of your employees. Um, I think the next wave is going to, it's, it's literally forcing uh, companies to relook at how they structure their practice. And the idea of, you know, I have seen people literally turn down offers with decent amounts of money and going, no, I don't want to work with your firm because you don't have a good work-life balance. That's what I'm looking for. I want to see more opportunities in these areas. And I really don't care about the money that you are offering me, I'd rather go to this firm. And so it is imperative, uh, if we're talking about business and holding accountable, it's, uh, it's literally about the, uh, the, the ability to, to continue to run your firm. Uh, you're gonna run into issues with uh, retention, um, office culture, and uh, those things will continue to happen if you're not looking at a, a holistic practice. Thank you for that, Matt. Kareem, could we get ready to launch the last three uh, quick questions here that we'd like everyone to respond to um, before we close out? The first one being, the financial risk for diverting resources to focus on DEI efforts is too high. Do you agree or disagree with this statement? The second one is, proving the business case to support diversity, equity, and inclusion implementation is a failed strategy and does not work. The third one is, what critical mass percentage do you feel is necessary to achieve in order for minority group voices to actually start being heard in your firm? And so we're really, you know, just kind of looking to, you know, to get people's opinions um, on this and, and knowing that uh, what may be working for one firm may not be working for another. And we also understand that there may be 
very opposing views on some of these topics and, and what you feel like you need to accomplish within your firm to actually see some change. So take, take a couple of seconds here and then um, we'll, we'll look at the answers quickly and then Don and I will bring the, um, the session to a close before Will closes this out. So we're at about 50%. We'll give you guys 30, 35 seconds um, since it's three questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thank you everyone for uh, your transparency and participation too. We appreciate it. So it's 71% and I think a few people are gonna, are starting to leave. So I'll give it just about 10 more seconds. Five seconds, four, three, two, one, all right. Okay, this is, you know, sort of real honest, uh, you know, answers here. And we know that we could definitely take probably so much more time to dive into to these topics. Um, but I think more than anything, we just really wanted to sort of provide a platform to hear from you all. Uh, to see exactly what your feelings may be towards this, how you're planning to approach it, what do you feel like the strong cases are for you for implementing it within your own firm, um, and just really how to keep the conversation and the momentum going. And so we know that we can have many more panels, we can invite experts on diversity, we can do trainings and um, all the above to sort of really try to continue to guide the conversations around this, but we really wanna challenge um, the firm leaders and to, to think about you know, having those conversations with your teams and making sure that you're really understanding the impact of those conversations. You know, going back to that fear element, you know, just understanding that we're all people. You know, we're really having to open the, the conversation and meeting people at those conversations. So we wanna make sure that you all feel supported that we support one another across the industry and that we, you know, continue to be as transparent and as vulnerable as we can to, to really see this through. So Don, if you'd like to leave any closing words, I think that's all I have to say at this point. <laughs> I think you wrapped it up very well. This was um, hopefully for you all, just like Jenny said, this is a, hopefully this is a good session for, you know, to wrap up all three panel discussions that were awesome. Um, and so we just wanted you all to have a little discussion and little interaction. So hopefully uh, you have some things to take back from, from all of this, this entire conference. So thank you all. Yes, thank you for your participation. Janice and Don, thank you. That was a wonderful discussion. Um, before we close today, you know, I want to say a warm thank you to everyone that's been in this room. Uh, we, we have up, up to 150 participants and we really appreciate that. We're also grateful for our sponsors. Um, but I would also like to take this moment to uh, recognize the JEDI committee and the, uh, you know, Joshua, Leslie, Janelle, and Zeba. If you could say a few words, we're encouraging everyone on this call to get involved with that. I put the link into the chat. Um, email me. I'll send you my email as well, will at aielosangeles.org. We really look forward to your involvement. And uh, Josh and Leslie and Janelle and um, Ziva, would you like to say a few words as we close the session? Uh, yeah, I can do a, a quick plug for us really quickly. Um, so the Je Jedi committee um, was just, just recently started. It's a joint AIA and SoCal NOMA committee. Um, and our, our purpose is to advance issues of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And so um, the way we find ourselves most productive is as we listen and understand um, these deeper issues through these town halls, through these different um, panels and things that we're having so that we can hear from 
the body what what it is that that we need to make our change changes um, with, um, and then also from that we develop programs and initiative to influence on um, these mission congruent decisions. Um, and so through through that we we really want to make sure that we're measuring and reporting accountability tools, much like the SoCal NOMA DEI challenge um, and partnering with different organizations that already have in place um, town halls and panels and different things like that. Um, so um, this is a committee that we want as many people as possible to be a part of. Um, before the end of this month, we'll, we'll be having our first official general body mm -hmm. committee mm -hmm. meeting where we, we, we start having a, a, a chance to be able to hear hear voices directly based on some of the initiatives that our committee has already um, decided we're gonna put in place, but we, we really wanna make this a collaborative effort um, because as a lot of people were saying throughout this this panel, throughout the Encompass um, is that change definitely needs to happen, um, but now is the point where we have to stop talking about it and we actually have to do it. Um, so like Will said, please shoot him over an email if you're interested and he'll put you in contact with us here. Um, and. Yeah, thank you very much. This, this is definitely a great panel. And Janelle, Zeba, Leslie, uh, additional co-chairs and vice co-chairs, if you guys want to say anything, please do. I just want to say that uh, this couple of days just been really amazing hearing so many thoughts and so many ideas that it's really going to help our team actually to uh, move this forward. So Joshua, I think, summed it up really well. We are really looking forward to see more involvement and more of you guys collaborating with us on everything that we're going to be doing uh, and going forward. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for participating. I would also add that um, I know that people are feeling overwhelmed because there are so many things to attack and there are so many things to work on. Um, Jedi is taking on as many as possible and it allows you to take as big a bite or as small a bite as you feel that you can in order to advance this cause. So please join us. And I would uh, want to echo Leslie's sentiment in the sense that um, I think the more people who get engaged with the conversation, the more um, internalized the value system becomes and having people who come from different um, organizations or from different perspectives can be valuable to, um, for people to really understand and internalize that this is not um, about pushing anyone out of a, a position. It's really about um, creating something valuable and getting to the best uh, performance for any particular firm. So, um, yeah, we're hoping that more people will get engaged and, in ways that are meaningful to you as well. So while we have, um, as the JEDI committee, the ways that, that we will primarily be engaged, there are other things that people can do to spread the, um, the values and um, in ways that, that are meaningful specific to, to you. So I'm, I'm saying students get engaged, leaders get engaged, people in the middle get engaged. Um, and uh, we look forward to really you know, making some impact that we can all see. Thank you so much. Kareen, do you want to close us out with our big uh, applause? OK, I'm going to unmute everybody. So for everybody to say a thank you to all of our speakers, panelists, students today, um, please unmute yourself. Um, Give everybody a warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. 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 Thank you